as you can imagine, in a fledgling democracy, civil society's role can never be underestimated. Ghana is no exception. And one particular civil society organization that concerns itself particularly with democracy is IDEG, the Institute for Democratic Governance. And its leader, as you can well imagine, has become a rather well-recognized personality. Today, we're spending time with Dr. Emmanuel Akwiti. Doc, good morning, and thank, thank you. you so much thank for meeting with us. Good morning, and welcome to IDEG. Thank you so much. A uh, great place you have here. Thank you. I feel like it's been a little too long since we caught up. <laughs> and so much has happened. You mean since you left radio? Uh, well, too long before you <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know how it is at multimedia. You never quite leave. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Yes, yes, yes. And um, uh, you know, so much has happened since yes. we last had the opportunity yes. to speak. Um, Ghana has a new EC chair. Yeah. Um, we've had a banking crisis. Yes. We've had uh, uh, almost two years of a new government and uh, several events have you know characterized that right. that tenure as well so I think it's a great opportunity to catch up sure. and um, maybe we'll start with the EC mm -hmm. um, new chair uh, yes. Jean Mensa new executive new executives as well uh, three other executives uh, have yes. been um, uh, uh, sworn in but um, of course that was a particular area of our governance that IDEG uh, you know was very concerned with and in fact, before the appointment of Jean Mensa, there were rumors that you were approached. Is that, is that the case? No. I was never approached by anybody. Oh, really? Um, not in 2015 and not in 2018. I heard the rumors myself, and I was looking forward to who talks to whom. The system, <laughs> I wanted to understand. Yeah. But I was never approached. Ah. So there's nothing like... I heard my name was where and certain groups behind this name and who is talking to <laughs> appointed authorities. <laughs> and I kept saying, but if it's me they want to work with, at least wouldn't anybody talk to me mm. and see what ideas I have and whether at all I could fit what vision they have and so on. Uh, they never talk to me. I hear that's the system. Mm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> But, but, so, but uh, so what you're saying is that it's possible you were considered, but no one spoke to you about it. Is that what you're saying? It's possible. I mm. mean, just like in 2015, you know, it went on for a long time. I think it started mm. somewhere in 2014. And I hear my name is all over the place and people are asking. I keep telling them, I, nobody has talked to me. Mm. And I don't know how to, to lobby and where to go. Mm. And, and it constrains you because sometimes you, even when we had commented, you remember when this issue came up in the yeah. Electoral Commission in 2017 and we, the Civic Forum met and yeah. we decided that, look, we should advise on um, how it should be handled so that the Commission as an institution would work. You know, and um, we, we issued a statement and soon after issuing the statement, I was interviewed and the motive, the fact that I was you know, hungry for this post, and that's why we've issued the statement. Mm. And I had some women activists, media people, you know, even having discussions in your studio, and the engine. And I said, look, I talk about this all the time. Um, what I talk about does not really define my ambition. Mm. Um, I, of course, have an ambition, and I'm in the game of um, looking at political issues and governance issues. I don't do it in a partisan way, but it doesn't mean I don't have views or interests that I, I'd like to. But what I'm interested in now is that our institutions work well, mm. and that it is the weakness of our institutions that is also giving us all the challenges we are facing in governance, in elections, in our national cohesion, and so on. And these are the things I've chosen to work on. Mm. So um, I refrain from going to talk to people who might say that, oh, so you came to talk to me because indirectly you want this and so on. And uh, I don't know, the system is, is strange. Had you been approached, would you have said yes? You see, what I, I told some people, and not only this time when it came up, I said, I don't know how to lobby. 
And I, but I want a conversation. And if the president calls you and says, um, we think you have the competence and the integrity to do this piece of work for us, is the national call. You go. Mm. You don't say, when the president calls, you respond. Mm. Especially in an area that we are so engaged. Because you have to think of the consequence. If the mm. president said, uh, we want you to serve here, he speaks for the nation. Mm. And you say, no, I can't do it. So how then can you continue to speak on the issues mm. when you've turned uh, you know, the appointment to be in a certain role or play a certain role in mm. that down? Mm. It becomes difficult. But you yourself said that you wanted a conversation. Yes, because if the president calls me, I'm sure, or whoever uh, were recruiting, mm. I'm sure they would engage me. I mm. mean, internationally, that's what. I have had to turn down many international appointments. I was called and mm. interviewed. Sometimes uh, from afar. Wow. Yes, and they would interview you and uh, want you to be this and so on and go through a whole lot of issues. Were you turning those down because you were holding out for perhaps this position? Oh, no, no, no. But <laughs> EC cannot be the only position to hold out for. Mm. I mean, we, we want to build a strong country, a strong nation, a strong economy. Yeah. The opportunities are vast and so on. But I've always felt that, well, I run an institution. Mm. I've also felt very strongly about stability. And the work we do contributes to stability, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Uh, we've innovated things in, in, in the sector. Mm. That helps us create the space for us to continue to reason. Yeah. And if you look at the reforms we are carrying out now, uh, we are uh, advocating and promoting uh, because the president had made a decision on it, local government and so on. Yeah. It is something that will transform the system. Mm. So sometimes you have to weigh it and say, well, yes, if I take on appointments, I mean, it's good for my pocket. One appointment I turned down, which was a very high UN appointment in Nigeria, and uh, they really wanted me to get involved, and I said, no, I can't. Hmm. And, um, and I said, yes, maybe the offer, I would never get anywhere. Hmm. I mean, how they were going to, how much they were going to pay me, hmm. and, you know, with the paraphernalia. Yeah, all that. Yeah. And so I'll not get it in Ghana hmm. or anything. But then I said to them, I couldn't. That was just before the 2012, uh, we entered 2012 and the 2012 yeah. elections. Hmm. And I said to them that uh, the Institute does very important work. And we're going through some very challenging times. And I couldn't see how I could just take the money. And when issues happened, and they said, where is Akwiti or Aidek? How do I respond to that? Mm, I'm and in so Nigeria on. with you my know, paraphernalia. Yes, I'm having a very good time <laughs> and a nice place and so on. So mm. I said to them, no. And they will bear that out. Yeah. Uh, there had been other requests uh, from South Africa, from AU, and so on. I, I tell them that. I'm doing a, an important piece of work in my country. And I, I, Let's get back to I'm doing that, that. Uh, important piece of work because yes. we do have a new EC chair and three other yes. executives. Yes. Let's talk about that. Let's do what you normally do, that, uh, uh, that uh, thought leadership that you normally bring to these conversations. Tell us, what are your views on the new uh, EC chair and the other um, appointees? I think, I think we welcome them. Uh, we were one of the first to write. Uh, we have a common platform. I know Jean very well. Um, mm. And um, uh, Dr. Bosman, I know, head of political science department and so on. Um, I don't know the third lady, but I've gotten, I have a sense of who she is mm. and so on. So, and then uh, Mr. Tete, the election, which is usually the senior most person in there, gets that position. Uh, I think this is a formidable team. We should learn from the lessons of the split that brought about the change. Um, when you have three key executives split the way it became in a quarrel that uh, also almost uh, was pulling an institution apart mm -hmm. and important functions were not uh, hard to wait because they just couldn't agree on how. That, I think that is what we should avoid because uh, I think the EC itself had gone through a series of traumas. Um, you know, every election puts it on the radar and accusations and so on. But I felt that uh, 2012 election and the 2013 uh, adjudication of the dispute, you know, the Supreme Court process, really tested them. They saw their leader. You know, 
uh, on the witness stand, the questions, the accusations, and so on. And then he left. Uh, institutions are human beings because they also run by human beings, you mm -hmm. know. And from afar, this is a national institution all over the country and districts and so on, regions and so on. So it, it does create doubt because some believe strongly they've done their work well. And then here is this, uh, you know, issue that had, it's either a stigma mm. <laughs> or it's something that makes you even doubt. Because you cannot, uh, some few would do bad things, but most of the time, they want to be seen as professionals. I've worked mm. with quite a number of them, and I think they know the stuff mm. they, they're dealing with and so on. So there was that trauma, and the leadership transition wasn't handled well. I think it took too long to determine who would succeed Dr. Farijan. I thought that the transition was so important that that person ought to work with Dr. Farijan for a while, you mm. know. And the issues that had come out that needed to be addressed from the crisis were on the table, and we had expectations as well. And you, I think we left the transition so late. I also feel that sometimes our political leaders and politicians think more about themselves than about the, the effects of their actions on institutions, mm -hmm. you see. Because um, if you move, we moved from the trial and then the verdict. And then that was 2013, and we did the transition, uh, the appointment in 2015, around July or so, at a time that Dr. Farijan had left. Yeah. You know, and then we had such a short time to local elections, about three months or so, Charlotte and her team. And then thereafter, this big election and so on. And there were so many issues. So everything is done within a short time, like fighting fire. We are expert crisis managers. But we ought to look at how we also govern in a very subtle and systematic way. But you know, they argue that they actually executed every single event as it came up. Whether there were issues or not, they got through it. And so if, you, if a question is of their competence, then they would argue that they proved they could do it. I'm not questioning their competence at mm. all. I'm looking at how decisions that should, we should make how we should make to strengthen yeah. institutions, not right. to weaken them. Right. Okay. So they executed it, yes, fine. Mm. I think it was one of the best elections, and mm. we all got involved and so on. But clearly then also we experienced a leadership conflict we've never mm. experienced. Could it be that the transition, if it had been handled differently, they would have known themselves, sorted out a number of issues, mm. and understood the spirit and soul of the institution, mm. the people in, the issues and so on. You know, but they were immersed in some kind of fire, mm. <laughs> you know, and they had to act because there was no time. So I'm looking at impact of decisions on institutions right. and so on. Now they are in, um, I like Charlotte's uh, vision of a world-class elections, mm -hmm. you know, which is where we should be mm. and, and, and truly turn out well. But if you look at what it took to get those results, it's also profoundly disturbing. You know, the, the armed uh, militants we saw in some elections in the north and mm. other parts of the mm. eastern or western region, the sheer fear of what was going to happen, the total mobilization of all security agencies, civil mm. society, peace pact, and so on. These are not things, these things cause as much as the elections. Then you remember the elections, uh, the voters register, mm. a new biometric register. Mm -hmm. And I hope you remember the role we played, I yeah. think, in, in the public debate mm. on whether it really must go there or not. And the mm. stand we took mm. that, no, let's, let's go surgical. Let's find a way of solving them because biometric is biometric and so on. So these are things we've done. I hope the, the, the idea of the first world-class election would govern the new team. I believe they are up to it. They've all had led institutions. Yeah. And they will find the cooperation. The challenge now is, in Dr. Faris Jan's time, or before Charlotte was appointed, it was a leader who exited, and a whole institution. Yeah. It, they stand in solidarity yeah. in that kind of situation. Yeah. But there was a leadership vacuum. Um, what we have now uh, with the new team is a situation where the workers are split. Okay, loyalties. Have, and so they will have to spend quite a bit of time in building, rebuilding, right. and reconciling, and so on. That sometimes could be time consuming, but I'm sure 
they would have advices and people who could assist to you do know, that. You know Jean Mensah personally? Yes, you I've, think I've she's, been working with her. You think she's well suited for the job? Uh, what, what would you consider to be her strengths and weaknesses going into this role? I don't know her that much to get into that. I haven't worked with her closely. She heads IEI, I, I, and we meet in various forums and speak. But I believe that uh, the president's judgment should would consist of all this, and I, I believe she could do it. You see, it's not a one-person job. After all, the chair is a primus inter pares, mm -hmm. you know, um, first among equals. And so you have um, um, a situation where you ought to uh, work collectively, and it's the collective work, you know, the collective leadership that we saw fractured. Uh, at a certain time. And it was not fractured over how to get us the, 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 the first election, the elections they got us, the results they got us. It was not so much about that. But it was also about other things that also makes that work effective. Right. So I think that coherence, the, the leadership bonding together, I believe that they would find their own dynamic. I don't know if they knew themselves previously and they had worked and so on. Mm. But I believe there's so much to learn from what has taken place. Right. And, and I believe that the chair would work with them well. Because what they should avoid is giving the nation a second. <laughs> and I think they would do it. Okay. I think we are happy to support them to work with them. Great. National interest, yeah. We'll come back and talk a bit more about the EC when we talk of um, local um, uh, local government elections mm. uh, uh, later. But I also want to ask about some of the other uh, big events that have occurred since we last mm. met. And perhaps I'll start with the most recent, the one everyone is talking about, massive banking crisis. Now, some might ask, what has that got to do with democratic governance? But clearly, it does have <laughs> quite a bit. A government on the behalf of the people of Ghana has yeah. made a decision to borrow, or well, to, to issue a bond, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about eight billion at the last time we checked, mm -hmm. uh, to bail out these seven banks that have been collapsed and dissolved and uh, acquired and, and purchased and so forth. Purchase and assumption and all of that business. Yeah. So, from your civil society perch, where you see quite far, how has this matter unfolded uh, to your thinking? And are there points at which perhaps we could have made better choices? Could we have avoided being where we are today? Um, first of all, let me clarify. The people in civil society are just like the people you find in the public sector, the state institutions and so on. Well-trained, competent, diverse professional backgrounds with vast experiences. Actually, civil society is where people who leave international organizations and government offices come yeah. okay, to work. Yeah. It's, so it's an important... So the competencies, it does not define our competencies. So going from there, well, um, from a political economy point of view, you know, governance is not just about democracy. Uh, I think when economic crisis of this nature or banking uh, challenges of this nature arise, the first thing you hear uh, governors or banking uh, professionals and experts speaking about is the governance. Uh, you know, uh, the governance of the sector, the governance of the institutions in trouble. How were they? Because the governors are the policy makers. They are uh, those who should hold management accountable. They, must, they are those who must defend the principles and the vision of the institution, you see. And so there are always questions asked. Um, they tend to be, and they are supposed to be, a bit detached from management, those who run the place and mm. so on. And that is also to enable them to take decisions swiftly to correct wrongs that may be taking place. And anything that threatens the existence, okay, poses an existential threat, mm. ought to be confronted by, by the board. They would make changes. They can fire people and so on. So when you get into a situation where uh, you take the seven banks and what you're told, uh, the question happened, and uh, what individuals to put money yeah. and loans that were given in spite of, and so on and so forth. You have to tackle governance at two levels. One is the institutional governance. Mm. Um, is this something where those who are supposed to lead, you know, were rather led 
mm -hmm. you know, by management. You but know. Dr. Mensah Otabil says he was a non-executive director and so was not involved in the day-to-day -day running of, of Capital Bank, for instance. I, I think um, not being, whether you're executive chair or not, you, you chair the board of a bank that came there for decisions that were decisive. So day to day, you might not be there, but you see, you can't be exonerated because he said, I didn't. You have to know that your name is on something. You have to know that if things go wrong, your reputation is at stake. It's a reputational risk when you are appointed a board chair, mm. you know. And you have to take interest when the books come, when the auditor's report come. And when, for example, the central bank said, we will have to bail you out. We're giving you, was it 610 or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 620 million, uh, million cities. cities to make sure that, you know, the bank operates and pays people and all that. Um, I think this usually will come to the attention of the chair because it's such huge money, bigger than the own. Mm. Full capital, and it must go, and what it needs to be used for. So, what are the purposes of the money? Uh, usually, for those who work with uh, donors with grants, you know, um, you the board ought to know what this money is for. You have to mm. tell them, you have mm. to inform them, and you have to use the money for what it's meant for. Otherwise, you will not get money again from the partners. Mm. I mean, and when one thing happens to one partner, it spreads within. The system, even those mm. who do not finance, you would know, mm. you know, and so there is some damage of uh, a collateral kind where uh, you were not directly responsible, but it, it taints you because quarterly management meetings or policy decisions bordering on policy and accountability of the management and so on mm. fall on your lap. What do you make of how he has managed the situation since um, the conversations began? Uh, after the collapse of five more banks. I mean, first he issued a statement, that's where he talked about being a non-executive director, which you say shouldn't exonerate him. But then he went further and did the God is good thing where he's not really addressing the issues. Uh, how does that... Um... I, I, I think as a Christian, uh, when we face challenges of this magnitude, we seek refuge, we pray to God because he solves our problems and everything, you know. We totally commit to him. And so it's right for him to do that. But I thought he also said that um, he's been to see Yoko and some investigations are going on. Yeah. And we also taught in the book, a good book, that give unto Caesar what is Caesar's yeah. and unto God what is God's. So to the extent that the laws of the country um, are there and there are have been violations and so on it is for the authorities to decide on where wrong has been done and what punishments ought to be meted out sanctions ought to be meted out mm -hmm. i think that is where my interest has been mm -hmm. that if we fail to enforce the law um, it will be such yet another bad example of lawlessness and another bad example of impunity that the system would collapse at some point. Mm. You know, in God's kingdom, there's discipline. <laughs> and there, is, there are principles you should follow. Mm. And we are told that when we sin, which he doesn't like at all, he turns away from us for mm. maybe a short while. We plead and we beg mm. in Jesus' name. We get it back and so mm. on. But still it counts. And we, I think that, I don't know the details of his role, and I cannot judge him, but I think that the law, um, the, the regulator, the central government mm. and the uh, law enforcement agencies and investigative agencies ought to do a professional, impartial job. Now from a, see, yeah. So that we get to know the truth and the sanctions are meted to correct the wrong and serve a strong warning to others that they shouldn't. But I wouldn't just look at board members and chairs and what I ask myself, central bank, 620, did they take interest in the governance of the banks and that's, why they were getting into trouble? That's actually a good point. I want us to talk a bit more about central bank in a moment, but just to round up on this issue we've been discussing. Mm. From a governance point of view, mm. um, in addition to having been a, a, a chairman of the board at Capital Bank, he's also the leader of a church. 
So let's talk about governance in that context. Um, you know, he starts off by saying that I know that you are being, you, my congregation, are being asked questions about this matter. Mm -hmm. So if you are asked, tell them God is good three times. Uh, in terms of governance of an institution like a church, do you feel there's an obligation of a church leader to explain his actions in his role in, an, in you know, a bank to the congregation of his church? Actually, I think, I can't remember, but I think I've heard uh, Pastor Mensah Tabel um, talk about the architecture of governance that God, you know, presents to us the elders and who should do what in the Old Testament. And he's spoken about it before. And, and so I think that um, we are not uh, in a theocratic state. You know, uh, through God, we are leaders and laws are made. He wants us to also respect our laws and uh, comply with them. So it gets a bit complicated. I think that although he said that, uh, he's a spiritual leader. And so he would also look to the trauma that might cause to people and say, we are told that no matter what happens to you, don't sit there and weep and say, oh God, yeah, I know you are my greatest protector, you love me, so why did you let me say thank him? Mm. In all things, thank God. And you know, God is good, he will sort out. He, I saw that as him saying this matter uh, goes beyond the church, of course, uh, Let's wait for the, for the, um, for the investigation and sure. the findings because then you could take him on. But at the moment, it's being investigated. And it's mm. quite a complex issue. Mm. And therefore, I felt that the right thing to do at that point is to give some assurance to your congregation by telling them that investigations are going on. Right. And it is only the investigators who would come and say that, yes, you were non-executive, but we hold you responsible for one, two, three, and mm. these are the decisions we are taking. Okay. Probably the lessons will be that um, banking could be quite complex. And I'm not sure, although somebody, I didn't read the statement, but I heard somebody say, well, given what, the reasons why he went in, helping someone who came from nowhere to, and um, he was looking at entrepreneurship and how to support and encourage people. Mm. And maybe the next time he might be more cautious but certainly there would be more conversations with the congregation when the report is out to determine the scope of responsibility or exemption or exoneration. And I think the church, they are mostly educated people I see mm -hmm. and very highly placed people. And I think some conversations will take place. Very well. Yeah, individuals might advise themselves uh, if they are not persuaded. And so, so there's a whole lot. But uh, I think he's responsible for his congregation and within the teaching, uh, that's what he would do. So we're talking about the Bank of Ghana and their role in this, and you asked an important question. Were yes. they even aware of what was happening at the governance level in these institutions? I, I was a bit, that's what I've thought about all the time, that, um, you know, we raise funds from development partners and donors who support the things we want to do. But depending on the amount of money they're giving to you, um, there would be an assessment of your uh, decision-making, financial control, governance, all those things will take place. You know, it, it doesn't go anywhere to the 620 million, you know. Mm. Yes, it doesn't. Sometimes 100,000, 200,000 uh, could generate that kind of, you know, interest. Scrutiny. Scrutiny, scrutiny. Mm. Audit reports. Um, sometimes they will talk to the auditors, you know, they will talk to bankers, mm. you know, they send internal auditors, there is the financial monitoring mission that will look at your internal controls, you know, and the internal auditors will come and every funder brings different people in place and so on. So the first question then would be that, um, what kind of mechanisms does the central bank have uh, in leveraging resource amounts of money? Does it raise, you know, the risk assessment, you know, stakes? And how does it relate to the bank? Um, I would presume that to decide this amount of money is going in, the bank had investigated to know why. 
you know, they mm. were in the situation. And genuinely, these were things beyond their control or something, and they needed to be built out. And sometimes they would ask you, we like a plan that would tell us that if we give this money to you, within the shortest possible uh, time, you will sort out the mess and you pay back the money. In the case of U.S., if you remember the crisis that President Obama was first tasked, and if you look at the kind of interventions they made, no bank was set free. Mm -hmm. They gave you money, but you paid back with mm -hmm. interest and so much. They got everything back as soon as you recovered, mm -hmm. you know, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I, I have been interested in understanding what conditions go with these kinds of money from the central bank. Mm -hmm. And if there were those conditions and they were being monitored, um, I think uh, the alarm bells would have been mm -hmm. would have sounded earlier, and well, so on. So there is some some culpability, some responsibility. The bank cannot just point the central bank cannot just point fingers at Capital Bank and UT Bank and so on. I hear in banking they call it supervisory something oversight or mm -hmm. field and so on. But I think it's more than that. Mm, on what, if, if an individual, mm -hmm. a private citizen or a businessman, wanted this kind of amount from the bank, they would demand quite a lot of information. The fact that you exist as business uh, for a long time does not matter. They want to know how you can pay back this money, the systems in place, the controls, the people involved, and so on and so forth. So um, there are questions to be answered. Mm. Uh, if they haven't been asked, then they should be asked as well. All right. uh, so this is, this is what I think. Okay. Um, let's pick another of the recent uh, happenings. The president had a bit of a reshuffle. Uh, Boachie Jacon, first of all, uh, found himself uh, sacked following uh, lots of contention over the Ameri deal. Now, the presidency didn't quite provide a reason, but someone close to the president said that he had been misled in that matter. How did all of that unfold uh, to you uh, in your, in your I, perspective? Uh, frankly, because it, you know, Bachi's exit sort of also brought some silence over the, I mean, it's not, it's not in the media mm. anymore and so on. I, I haven't, I sought to understand what the issues were, what, what, what does misle mislead or mislead and mean. Uh, clearly, some process must have failed, you know, because things that appear on, a, on the president's table must be processed by people he's mandated to make sure, because you'll be held accountable. If you, if you mislead the president because he acts on recommendations, you know, in the civil service, you sign, mm -hmm. this are your, and so on and yeah. so forth. So um, it's something worth looking, and I thought probably media people would want to understand. I pick my information mostly from the media and the analysis. And, and to be honest with you, I haven't delved deeply into it. But mm. I, a few times I've wanted to understand um, how did it occur? Because it sends a certain signal. Our president handles extremely important you know, decisions. Every decision he makes impacts not only the 27 or 28 million Ghanaians, mm. it, could, it could turn the economy upside down, and it has re repercussions or implications for even the sub-region, mm. you know, because Ghana's role and so on. So we ought to understand how this came about, and probably that is something that one, uh, we might know in, in, in the near future. But for now... You think I, the, the president should... Um because he does have the power to do so, explain his decision? I think uh, from a governance perspective, my interest will be how he was misled. You know, the decision-making process and the responsibilities, the authorizations, you know. Something must have fallen through. Something probably wasn't looked at. Or have we evolve into a decision-making process where besides the formal, there is also some informal, more powerful unseen forces. I don't know, yeah. but it raises those questions. I, I, uh, you know, part of my interest scholarship is in decision-making, yeah. policy-making, and the factors that determine that. Yeah. And I think that I've talked about this a few times, that uh, to the extent that our public service is weak and our parties you know, 
um, have become more transactional, okay, and accumulating in, in, in focus, you see, than pursuing the real agenda of building the state institutions and making sure that the resources are being used to help them achieve their goals within a certain set time. We are giving four years. The four-year time frame means that the electorate expects you to give them heaven. Mm -hmm. And they think you have enough power, people, money, wealth, resources, and so on to deliver this. And if you look at the last 26 years, what we, we get, and after the four years, how the economy had sunk, <laughs> you know, Mm. Lower a macroeconomic stability um, is some other question. IMF, World Bank has to come in, and this has been the cycle, and so and we have to be rescued. And when we're given mm. like 140 million after uh, IMF mission, we're so happy we got mm. 140 million for a country, billions, 40 something billion per mm. annum, you know. So there are issues with with the system we've set up, and I think. Probably the president um, ought to consider looking at the decision-making processes mm. and the responsibilities of the officers put in, ta in, in, in touch. It's an interesting research thing. Uh, either a commission, a committee, or something is set up to look at. And there are many experienced uh, uh, retired civil servants who could probably look at some of these issues and so mm. on. But the signals it sends is that uh, the president ought to be uh, more cautious and needs more, not his own attention, but the people he's charged ought to be make, ought to make sure that it is thorough. Mm. You see, the, the important function of the public service, whether it's civil servants we're looking at and so on, is to, is to constrain action, okay, to ensure that rules and procedures are complied with. That is the important. That's why we talk about red tape. Of course, some uh, people who are not just performing, <laughs> you see. But within the red tape, you also must speed them. But the essence of the red tape is compliance, procedure. It's, it's all procedures hmm. and justification and so on. And so uh, the weakness of the system we have probably is creating problems. Hmm. And maybe the president has, or some people around him have said he's being misled. Who knows that it hadn't occurred in the past two? Mm. I remember that um, President Kufo, there was some loan or something that had to be done. And I think things had to be delivered by a certain date. And they were not where they should be at the time. So it delayed certain processes. I, I faintly recall that something hmm. about some international transaction happened. And it, it delayed, you know, mm. some processes and so on. So, so you reckon gaps in our decision making may have caused this to happen in the past as well? It, I, I don't think it's mm. now. Mm. I think I think that if you look at the game we are playing now, uh, patronage has um, devolved. Uh, sorry, uh, evolved to something else. Mm. You know, uh, financiers. The crisis in the financial, the banking sector, is also probably reflect the crisis in the political sector. Yeah. Political sector where the politicians are. Yeah. The politicians are not civil society. They are not private sector. Yeah. Uh, in, in our academic discussions, they belong to what we call the political society or the political sector. Right. And regulation is crucial yeah. of that sector to ensure that within their democratic space and rights, they are also complying with the law. Indeed. And you've seen how in Israel, mm. the state of Israel, the prime minister, how many ha times has he been questioned? Mm. He's been questioned about five times within the last year. Mm -hmm. um, and previous president, they even imprisoned the president and yeah. so on. So the focus on probity, accountability, the use of public resources, and your behavior and actions and so on is so strong. And once they have reason to investigate He's prime minister, Indeed. you know, yeah. he's prime minister, but yeah. they go in. Then okay. you look at other countries, I mean, many, even the same Israel, some prime ministers and mayors have gone to jail, yeah. sometimes over campaign financing yeah. and what favors were courted and so on. 
Uh, Germany itself had had its in Chancellor Kohl, you know, the, mm -hmm. the post-war yeah. giant of a leader for them mm -hmm. and so on. And he had to leave office. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you found the cases in the UK. You remember the scandal in Parliament? Yes. And uh, when parliamentarians mm -hmm. had taken more than and yeah. so on. The they responded. Yeah. But after Parliament had dealt with it, the police also went in and said, well, yeah. according to the law, and some are in jail, you know, they were prosecuted. And so Can Ghana so, ever get to that point? I Ghana, mean, if we want to, if we are not going to get into that, you cannot leave the political sector unregulated. And let me tell you what, the problems we are facing and why the whole governance has become transactional and commercialized and so on uh, by people, sometimes they are faceless, you can't see them. You know, and I'm sure that when president is making appointments, he encounters a lot of lobbying and people who would, you know, in my case, I didn't get anybody to, uh, so it's okay. But you see, <laughs> but, but I think he must be confounded. What interests are being pursued? Because the state is just not an orbit of interest. There are conflicting interests in the state mm. among civil servants, well, and so on. But it's also the state is wealth, it's resource, it's everything is there, mm. you know. And it is power, financial, economic, political, uh, influence, prestige. Everything is there. Mm. So people go there not always to serve the needs of the majority. It's not our happening. That's why parties have ideologies. Some go there to serve their needs, mm -hmm. use the state power and access to enrich themselves and do other things. Yeah. So these things are there, but it is the obligation of the state and our leaders to build strong institutions that would ensure that the resources, our tax money and other things, are really devoted to improving the conditions of life, the living right. standards of our people. And right. regulation comes in just to ensure that. Mm. So look at the banking crisis we've been talking about. The regulation came in. There's a regulator, governor, uh, uh, central bank. And I, and I think that in spite of the problems and the questions I've asked, I still feel that there's one regulatory institution, regulator, that is flexing its muscles. Mm. We must encourage them to do more. Right. Because I think they themselves might even come under some political pressure. Mm. So there's political pressure on everyone. Mm. But who are these forces? Who really wants to take charge of the state and control our resources and channel them into places that benefit? It's a question we must ask. Mm. So to have a system, all the regulations in the Constitution, Article 55, okay, which is the political parties thing, mm. speaks about parties not getting involved in local elections. It's happening. CDD Afrobarometer 2018, go and read it. Mm. Uh, uh, NCC 2015 August published and they are there. So that prohibition is not holding and yeah. it's even getting worse. Okay. Mm. Now you go to the second one, the transparency in party financing and mm. accounting. Yeah. It's not taking place. Mm. The problem may be that we haven't set up institutions right. that ought to focus on these things because of the magnitude of the challenge they pose mm. and the greater damage that they could do to our democracy right. and democratic governance. Okay. We need more institutions specialized in dealing with this because it's quite it's becoming quite complex to track that. Yeah.